In this, the second lesson of the Henry George School of Social Sciences course, Understanding Our Political Economy, we will introduce the essential elements of political economy, the essential terms utilized, and how these terms are defined in the study of how systems of political economy evolve and function. When Henry George was writing Progress and Poverty during the 1870s, his reading of other political economists convinced him that a major problem with their analyses was the inconsistent use of terms. He committed to be as clear as possible in his use of terms and to provide and adhere to the definitions he believed were consistent with a fundamental understanding of the scientific principles involved. He started with clearly defining the three distinct factors of production. As defined by Henry George, political economy is the science that examines the means by which wealth is produced and distributed to the three factors of production, land, labor, and capital. And by capital is meant the tangible assets applied in the production of other tangible assets. Note that what political economy is concerned with is the very specific meaning of wealth, a meaning not always consistent with common everyday use of the term. Also distinct in political economy is the selection of the term land to take in the entire natural world, including our atmosphere. All that the natural world offers to us for our use and exploitation is land. Thus land includes the forests and natural resource laden lands and the resources these lands hold. The seas and seabeds, rivers, lakes, and all the plants and animals contained therein. All non-domesticated plants and animals that inhabit the planet. The broadcast spectrum for radio and television transmission. Air lanes for travel by airplane or satellite paths in space. Wind and solar energy to be captured and utilized. And of course, the parcels of land in our cities and towns where we live, play, and engage in commerce. How access to nature is granted or awarded is a primary concern of the political economist. Is access to land, to nature, a right or a privilege? Should control over land be exclusive or conditional? awarded by competitive auction for use under a leasehold interest or deeded by governments and thereafter sold owner to owner. Another important characteristic of nature is that nature has a zero cost of production in terms of our labor and capital goods, the active factors in the production of wealth. Again, people and the goods we produce that are then used to produce more wealth are referred to as the active factors of production, labor and capital goods. Land is, in this sense, passive, the source of the wealth we produce, but not included in the definition of wealth applicable to the study of political economy. With the introduction of increasingly sophisticated forms of capital goods as tools and machinery, the production process evolved to become very specialized, incorporating methods that required the division of labor into narrower and narrower activities. Over the centuries, output per unit of input of labor and capital goods has resulted in an ever-expanding storehouse of wealth to be consumed, saved, or converted into even more capital goods. To help describe the contributions of particular types of labor, the language of political economy further divides labor into categories based on the closeness to labor's direct application to land and the use of natural resources. These primary types of labor include resource extraction, agriculture, timber harvesting, fishing, and hunting. Once raw materials are produced, a secondary category of labor is engaged in milling, refining, combining, and processing of materials. 
Materials are then converted into new forms when they are ready for use in manufacturing and assembly of finished goods, which are then transported to their final destinations for sale and consumption. Also essential to our modern economic system are service providers. The size of the service sector of most of the world's largest economies continues to expand. In fact, the line between goods production and providing services is often very blurred. Architects and engineers are very much engaged in production. Accountants and lawyers, bankers and financial advisors, as well as insurers, are less so but still required to secure financing and other contractual relationships meeting the needs of all parties involved. Henry George explains where services fit into the analysis of wealth production. He writes, labor always produces either wealth, which may or may not be capital, or services. Only in an exceptional case of misadventure is nothing produced. Misadventure more frequently results in the production of goods, the sale of which generates too little revenue to cover the cost of production. Thus, producers take a calculated risk that there will be sufficient demand for what is produced. Economics, but not political economy, generally treats entrepreneurship as a special form of labor and a factor of production in its own right. In our study of political economy, the differences in individual ability are treated as the basis for specialization and the division of labor. People tend to gravitate to what they do best or have a natural inclination toward. Thus, given the same access to land and capital goods, some individuals will be more productive than others. To summarize, when we refer to wealth in political economy, we are dealing with the goods produced that we may consume right away, save for later consumption, or convert into new forms of capital goods. Labor applied to land produces some form of tangible good. However, to be included in a society's storehouse of wealth, the good must have some exchange value in the marketplace. A common question that arises in the study of political economy is whether money is wealth. This course will explore the subject in some depth. For now, consider that our definition of wealth means that some forms of assets commonly thought of as wealth and that have an exchange value in markets do not qualify as wealth in our study of political economy. These include currency and coinage. They are mediums of exchange that allow holders to acquire and exchange actual wealth more easily than by bartering of services or goods. Gold and silver have historically been both commodities and, when converted into coinage, money that has a high intrinsic value. Precious metals, as coinage or bullion, have often backed paper currency in circulation. And of course, gold and silver have always been held by investors as hedges against the declining purchasing power of paper currencies issued by governments or banks. Also, other legal claims on tangible goods, such as mortgages and bonds, fall outside the definition of what is wealth in our study of political economy. They usually, but not always, have exchange value, but they are not tangible goods that are to be consumed or converted into forms of capital goods. Most importantly, land is not included in our definition of wealth for the basic reason that nature is not produced by human labor. Nature is the source of all wealth, but is not itself wealth, even though access to much of nature commands a price charged by those who happen to hold a deed or otherwise control land. In prehistoric times, most of what we produced was almost immediately consumed. Much of what we produced was lost because of the inability to preserve and store wealth. The amount we produced was small because people had not yet discovered how to convert wealth into effective tools, into capital goods, to facilitate greater wealth production per unit of labor. 
The introduction of new and more effective forms of capital goods brought on important changes in the overall organization of societies. The extended life and usefulness of capital goods, such as buildings, machinery, and other equipment, is what allows for the high standard of material well-being at least some of us experience. Today, economists and business journalists use the term capital to describe not only capital goods, but increasingly any asset, material or otherwise, that is considered to play a productive role in an economy. For purposes of scientific investigation and analysis, this has had unfortunate consequences. In the most basic sense, each of us requires access to the earth to survive. Thus, as Henry George and other political economists argued, the earth must be treated as a commons, accessible by all and under rules that guarantee full equality of opportunity. If the earth is in fact our shared commons, this should have become a governing principle of systems of property law in every society. Other than the larger portion of the planet's oceans, at least so far, most of the planet is claimed by some people to the exclusion of others. The challenge is how to fairly allocate access to the Earth and the Earth's natural resources, protect what we produce with our labor as our private property, but also prevent some from gaining a monopolistic degree of control over land and other natural resources. As the 20th century advanced, a number of thoughtful individuals realized that an understanding of political economy was needed by everyone, not only students of economics at colleges and universities. It was with public education in mind that the Henry George School of Social Science was established in 1932. Raising political economy to the level its study once enjoyed challenges economics on many of its basic theoretical positions. To grasp the full depth of the principles of political economy, one must gain a thorough understanding of the role land and the control of land plays in the production and distribution of wealth. By the 1960s, many economics textbooks no longer even listed land in the index. Only a small number of mainstream professors challenged this theoretical revisionism. Harry Gunnison Brown, one of the few economists whose writings built on the principles of political economy, explained his reasoning. The factors of production may be said to be land, labor, and capital. Other writers class land with capital, but we have already found reason to consider land separately from goods produced by mankind. Among economists today, there are some who do argue that land must be treated as a distinct factor of production and that land markets operate quite differently from markets for labor and capital goods. A key difference is that the supply of land is fixed by nature, that is, its supply is inelastic. Changes in the market price for land will not result in an increase in the total supply. This is reflected on this supply-demand chart by a vertical supply curve. Mason Gaffney, a longtime professor of economics at the University of California, has provided us with the details of how modern neoclassical economists came to remove land from their analyses with tragic real world consequences. He writes, Neoclassical economics has dominated thinking and policy now for a half a century or so. They have dismantled most of the reforms of the progressive era and discredited their rationale. They have successfully stifled the movement to convert the general property tax into a pure land tax. Going further, they have shifted taxes off property, especially land, and onto payrolls and retail sales. They have achieved uniformity in income taxation and more given preferential treatment to land income and unearned increments. They have privatized or are privatizing much of the public domain, including fisheries, the radio spectrum, water, and the right to clean air without compensation to the public. 
Robert Lekachman, an economist sympathetic to the view that government should secure for all citizens necessary basic social welfare goods, also voiced serious criticisms of his professional colleagues. In his book, Economists at Bay, he wrote, When bright people say stupid things, the question inevitably arises, why is their perception of reality so blurred? Good economists are bright men and women. All the same, economists do make the oddest statements and promulgate undue quantities of faulty prophecy and policy prescription. The failure to distinguish land from capital goods under property law and taxation policies is the most serious consequence of the confusion created by neoclassical economics. As we will discuss in some detail, the result has been to encourage and reward speculation in all forms of land while imposing heavy tax burdens on labor and the owners of real capital goods. We have reached the end of lesson two.